Welcome to Bike Life Radio from KWNK 97.7 FM, Reno Bike Project, and BikeWashoe.org in Reno, Nevada. We ride our bikes out into the world with a recorder, and we talk to people about their bikes and their lives. What a concept. I'm Kai Plaskon. Ride on. Today, we're preparing for the National Bicycle Summit. It's in Washington, D.C., and it's happening in March. Uh, we're finding out why a bike summit is important. Uh... To break up the seriousness a little bit, we talked to a Reno guy who built a bike with which you can have sex, uh, and then it got stolen. Uh, when we, <laughs> then we get serious again, and we take a trip to Tahoe to talk about uh, what it's like to commute by bike up there in the winter and throughout the year. First, the news. Now, our Google search of news for the word bicycle this month landed 276,000 stories on bicycles in just one month. No, I didn't read all 276,000 stories, but here's 10 of uh, 10 of them. Uh, in international bike news, Rotary International is reporting that the World Bicycle Relief Fund has given away 684,000 bikes in 21 countries, most of them in Africa. To explain why this is important through just one anecdote, uh, the Bike Relief Fund tells the story of how it's not safe for a woman to walk, for instance, to her destination. But if she has a bicycle, it's safe to get through dangerous places fast. Speaking of women, Specialized has shut down its women's clothing brand, Machines for Freedom. It was a progressive brand focused on inclusivity and varying uh, body shapes and sizes. Where do you store your bike in Amsterdam? Well, underwater, of course. Uh, you can get a tour now of this underwater bike storage facility, bike garage. Uh, you can get that tour on the internet now. Uh, it's this huge facility and it fits over 7,000 bikes. It's well lit, it's really nice in there and it's not wet for some reason. Speaking of water, well, what about a floating bike, huh? Uh, I, I don't really know if this bike floats or not, but uh, it's made out of bamboo, uh, which is wood, and I think wood floats. Uh, but guess how long it would take you to make a bike out of bamboo? One hour, two hours? No, 80 hours! Uh, that's according to Bamboo Bicycle Club. Yes, there is a Bamboo Bicycle Club. And now that club is selling bamboo bikes that you can build yourself much faster than 80 hours. You just get a kit in the mail and you stick it all together. There's too many bees in this story. Let's move on. In national bike news, in North Dakota, you cannot get a DUI on a horse or a bike anymore. The DUI laws are being changed so that people aren't punished for choosing a safer mode of transportation than a car when they are drunk. Now, drunk North Dakotans only have this uh, tough choice to make. Do I, do I take the bike or the, or the horse when I'm drunk? Utah has a law firm dedicated to bicyclists. It's called, well, what else? Bike Legal. They work with insurance companies so that bicyclists get the most money that they can when they are hit by people in cars. So far, uh, they claim to have recovered millions of dollars for cyclists. We mentioned the 200,000 bike stories in a month, right? Uh, so many of those stories are accident related uh, throughout the entire world. Uh, they're related to drivers killing a lot of bicyclists. Um, in Orange County, there's a particularly egregious one that has rocked the community there. A driver in a fit of rage hit an emergency room doctor on a bike and then stabbed him to death. The Orange County District Attorney said an innocent man is dead because he took a bike ride to enjoy a beautiful California day along the beach and was hit and stabbed to death by a stranger. This is the stuff of nightmares. While stories like this are really depressing, it's an important fact that we need to recognize people on bikes are often treated inhumanely by drivers and not protected the way we deserve to be on our public streets. 
You're listening to KWNK 97.7 FM by the Reno Bike Project. In local bike news from Bike Life Radio and BikeWashoe.org, Holcomb Street near Midtown will have the city's first buffered bike path. That means that instead of just one painted white line to protect cyclists, well, there's going to be two painted white lines to protect cyclists. That's double the safety, right? Uh, The Regional Transportation Commission notified cyclists about this buffer this week. They were planning to make the buffers end right before intersections so they could install a turn lane for cars. Uh, Intersections are the most dangerous spot for cyclists, though, so that was a really bad spot to end buffers, uh, any kind of protection. And so the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance used public comment to oppose ending the buffers at intersections, and they fixed it. Go RTC! Reno could have a new adaptive cycling center at the 219-acre Rosewood Nature Study Area. The city is piloting the program this summer. The trails connect to the Tahoe Pyramid Trail. The Tahoe Pyramid Trail extends from Tahoe all the way to east of Sparks today. Janet Phillips is the legendary person who put that grand vision of building the Tahoe Pyramid Trail together for 20 years. She passed away in December, succumbing to cancer. In her own words, quote, Don't be too sad. I had an exciting and wonderful life, she said. A memorial bike ride will be held in her honor in spring of 2023. You can learn more about the trail at TahoePyramidTrail.org. Speaking of rides, the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance, Rotary International, and Downtown Reno Partnership are planning a family ride through Downtown Reno on May 13th in the morning. It's going to be a very short and cheap and fun uh, ride with tables and music and giveaways and stops at parks and playgrounds. It's educational, too. We're going to be explaining what kind of bike infrastructure we need to keep families safe and improve safety downtown every day, not just during special events. This bike ride was recommended by the League of American Bicyclists to provide a long-term funding source for Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance and our advocacy efforts. Go to bikereno.com for the May 13th ride details. That's it for bike news from bikewashoe.org. A reminder that Bike Life Radio airs on the first Sunday of every month at noon right here on KWNK 97.7 FM from the Reno Bike Project. Today on Bike Life Radio, the National Bike Summit from the League of American Bicyclists is coming up next month. Anyone can join in person or virtually. The Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance will be there. Uh, Karen Whitaker is the Deputy Executive Director of the League, and she joined us to talk about what's in store for the summit in Washington, D.C. Here she is. How long have you been there? Uh, Ten years as of last December. December 20th. Ten years? Wow. Yeah. That's a long time. It is. And I was at another bike group before that, but oh I took the job um, in 2009. It was a one year job. And I thought, oh, this will be good to do something different for a while. And then I'll move back. But uh, I just loved it and I've stayed. Wow. So wait, you were at the bike, the bike, one bike group, and then you thought you'd go to another bike group for a, just a year. And then, and then go um, back to the other bike group. No, I was actually I was doing um, international relations, and I wanted to do something that felt more local and concrete for a little while. And at that time, I got hired for a group called America Bikes, which was a coalition of all the national groups. And that was it. Was like. They thought it was only going to be a year. It ended up being four years. But then that group sort of went defunct at the end of the bill. And the league had been a member of America Bikes. And so then I joined the league in the fall of 2012. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's been great. I really love working here. It's a great group of people. It's a a great group of people. advocates and people around the country at state and local groups that we get to work with. Uh, And so I feel like I'm still learning and I still, and I have some freedom to think about, you know, what I want to do next. So it's been, it's been really fulfilling. 
How has the league changed, would you say, over the 10 years? I'd say, well, one thing we've put a lot more emphasis on equity, both racial and socioeconomic equity, which has been really interesting. Uh, I think, you know, it's, I've been here 10 years, but there's, I think five or six of us, half the staff have been here 10 years or longer. So, you know, we've really sort of grown together with the organization and been like, okay, you know, we're working more on equity. We're thinking more about the connections to the state and local level. And that's been really interesting. And over the last few years, we've been uh, fortunate enough to begin to hire some some new staff. So now we have a whole new group of um, folks coming in that, you know, ha- are coming in with new ideas and, and new thoughts about, well, maybe we should, you know, change this process or how do we appeal to a younger audience? And so that has been another learning experience for all of us. Huh. Speaking of a younger audience, one of the things that's come into, uh, into my view and it's probably definitely on, on your radar is the the bike life movement. People with like big BMX bikes riding and doing wheelies through cities. And that's a, a real kind of equity focus, uh, you know, potentially and, and a, a very, um, I guess, diverse group of people. Um, is, is that something that's on the bike league's radar and are you reaching out to them or is that a challenge? Would you say? Uh, we are a a little bit, you know, we've definitely heard about kids now selling their video games to buy bikes and, you know, we love to hear that for, um, you know, the physical health for building community for all of those, for all those reasons. That's amazing. I've never heard that before. People yeah. selling video games to ride bikes or buy bikes. That's amazing. Yeah. It, and that's, I guess, the the peer pressure kind of thing. If they're in a big group of people who like to do wheelies down the street and you want to hang out with them and you don't have a bike, then what do you got? You got some video games you could sell and then you get a bike. That's good, interesting new information. Thanks. Yeah. And I think um, even before COVID, we saw more people spending time sort of indoors alone. And then COVID just accelerated that. So having those options to get people outside and and just interacting more, I think it, it's really positive, uh, both at the individual level and at the community level. Sure. Also, there's also a National Bike Council, um, and they do a bunch of sessions at the National Bike Summit. And they, they've had their own summit in the past. Um, so we do hear more from them. And I think also when you're a staff that's been working together for seven, eight, nine years, um, it's great to have some new folks come in and um, shake things up a little bit. Yeah. So. Uh, and so one of the things that we're, we're talking to Karen Whitaker with the League of American Bicyclists. Uh, where are you located, by the way? Where am I talking to you from? I, I guess I'm, I'm in Washington, D.C. Sorry. Uh. I'm in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Uh, and so... Uh, do you walk over to the, like the, not the white house, but the Capitol and just start talking to people about bikes sometimes? Is that what you do or what's it? What yeah. do you do? So I do do the federal policy and the lobbying. So, and I actually live fairly close to the Capitol. So I particularly pre COVID, I literally would walk over to go to meetings and meet with members of Congress. Um, since Congress that since COVID that started to open up again, I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, I spend a lot of my time talking to um, mostly the staff of elected officials, sometimes members of Congress like uh, Earl Blumenauer from Portland, Oregon, who's been just the leader in Congress for biking. And now that we have that big infrastructure bill that passed at the end of 2021, I spend a lot of time talking to people who work at uh, the Department of Transportation. Hmm. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do on Bike Life Radio is we try not to take ourselves too seriously. Um, and so, uh, you know, do you walk over when you go and you talk to a congressperson or you show up or you, you know, are talking to the Department of Transportation? They're like, oh, my God, Karen's going to talk to us about bikes. 
or you know where's your bike karen do they joke do they joke with you about that kind of thing uh they do a little bit uh mm-hmm. i think it's especially when i first started people would always ask me oh did you bike here and i think <laughs> uh-huh. dc has become a better city for biking and so i think now they just assume it mm. yeah oh that's kind of cool good yeah. cool. That's a big change over the past two years, like anecdotally that you've seen, I guess. Yeah, right? yeah that's pretty neat. Um, and so speaking of uh, riding your bike to potentially go and, and meet a congressperson or whatever, whoever it happens to be, um, do you have a bike story that you'd like to share? Like some sort of, I was riding my bike and I crashed into the president or something? Or <laughs> um, Well, I'll tell you, one story is that there's a member of Congress uh, from California who's a huge bicyclist, and he just invites everyone he sees, like, "Come go for a bike ride with me. Come go for a bike ride with me." <laughs> really? So I, Who is yeah. That? Um, Who's his that? name is Mike Thompson. Huh. Um, and so I've I've biked with him a few times, and sometimes other members of Congress will be there. Sometimes it's someone from his staff or a friend of a friend who's, you know, he's been like, "Oh, come bike." And we did this one ride once um, with another member of Congress. And it was, I don't know, it was probably 25 miles. And we got, by the time we were halfway there, it had taken us, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes. And the other member of Congress was like, well, you know, I have a a meeting in the Capitol in an hour. So we, I really need to go. And I have never ridden so fast on a trail in my life. He just, he needed to get back and changed into a meeting. And, you know, I was just like, got to keep with him. Got to keep with him. Because, you know, you don't, you don't want to be the reason the, the Congresswoman's late for a meeting. So we had a very, very fast ride back. Cool. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I've noticed over just a couple of years of being the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance president here is that um, there's a, a quite a gap in understanding between people's experiences. There's like the congresswoman who, you know, can ride a million miles an hour on the trail. And then there's uh, the experience of somebody who's never ridden a bike and uh you know, I was terrified of the roads. And I, I had a, I, I think that's what I spent a lot of time doing is explaining that uh, to cyclists, not everybody feels like you, you know, and is that brave. And so there's like this kind of insul- in, insularity or insulation or something among a lot of cyclists that, that are advocates, but maybe not the type of advocate that would really uh, benefit infrastructure for young people for instance is that is that something that you're experiencing nationwide or uh how how is, is that new to the so league? no it you know it's not new back in the 70s the league really would say that you should be able to bike the speed of, of traffic and just stay in the middle of the lane and um you know act like a you're driving a car and that's great if you can do it but most people no one most, can. yeah certainly <laughs> kids can't a lot of women can't and so if we really want and a lot of men can't either if we really want cycling to be more universal and a, and another option for transportation um then we need to be more inclusive and you know they've done studies that show that 60 percent of americans want to bike more or are interested in biking more, but they're concerned about safety. So we call them the interested and concerned. And so when you see um, protected bike lanes go in, uh, separated bike lanes, you see a lot more people biking and a lot more diversity of people, whether that be age or gender um, Hmm. or experience. And so we've really focused now on building safe and accessible infrastructure. Because that that separation from cars can really make a difference. And what we found is that drivers like it too. They like knowing that, okay, that's the space for people on bikes. This is the space for me to drive. Um, I think a lot of the anger 
we hear from drivers against bicyclists is, is fear that they're going to hit somebody. Yeah. And so when it's, when we make the roads safe for everybody, or, you know, you have those separated facilities, so, um, and people feel safer, there's less of that tension. You're listening to Bike Life Radio from KWNK Studios. I'm Kai Plaskon. Right on. <laughs> we uh, are going to be right back. The bike cat purrs, soothing stiff bones, meows, playfulness, a ball of string we chase, petting the road, stuck static fur. But danger we dodge, metal boxes and big wheels, together the pride circles, claws come out, stand up on our pedal paws, for pride we have. This spring, join the cats as we play, dance and celebrate safety for all who meander on two wheels. BikeReno.com Don't be left scratching around in the litter box. You. Join us. BikeReno.com this spring. Uh, now we're back to our interview with Karen Whitaker of the League of American Bicyclists. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And someday on Bike Life Radio, we should talk to a psychologist about what is going on in the mind of a driver when they see somebody on a bicycle that's vulnerable. Because, you know, you hear all the time that drivers are like really angry and yelling at somebody to get off the road. And it's not, it may not necessarily be because they think that the bicyclist doesn't have a right to be there. They're just terrified in their own mind that they're going to kill somebody and they really don't want that to happen. And maybe reacting in the wrong way. Uh, to that situation. Yeah. Um, Karen, why are we talking to you today? I, I think it's because we have a summit coming up. Is that is that right? Yes, we have the National Bike Summit coming up at the end of March. It's March uh, 26th through 29th. And there's an in-person version here in D.C., but there's also a virtual uh, version that you could do from wherever you are. Me. And so... I didn't know about it until uh, we won the League of American Bicyclists Bike Friendly uh, Community Workshop, and then we got some free attendance things. And uh, and so I'm going to go and I'm going to bring my daughters, uh, but I don't know anything about it other than looking at uh, a potential program. Do like a hundred people show up, or what? What is what is it like? So I'd say it's the biggest gathering of advocates of bike advocates in the country. And it's, um, you know, the numbers are funny because some people are virtual or some people are in person, but it's, it's really a great opportunity because in your community, your advocates often find themselves of being like one of maybe 10 or 20 or 30 people doing what they're doing. And when you get to the summit, there's those groups from all over the country that have been working on this. And sometimes they've had similar issues so that um, maybe you've had a success that you can help somebody with by saying what you learned through that success, or maybe you're, you're struggling with getting something through city council and there'll be another group there that's done it. So we have all of those things uh, for people that are in state or local organizations. There'll be workshops on how to fundraise, how to work with uh, families maybe who lost someone from uh, a traffic crash. Uh, and then there's also a set of workshops for people who teach bicycling education. Um, how do you get it into your schools? Or um, how do you work with people with disabilities when you're teaching biking skills? So it's everything from education to policy to um, how to grow an organization. And it's really a good time. Um, the, we often have a movie night or um, trivia or just some fun, fun, bicyclists are fun people, you know, there's fun things to do. Uh, and then on the last day, on um, March wait, wait, 29th. Wait, hold, hold on a minute. You said that bicyclists are fun people? Yeah. Really? Like I why? Think so. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, like, uh, what do you think makes a bicyclist a fun person? It's the endorphins. Ah, uh-huh. 
<laughs> All right, excellent. Um, and so, and then I'm sorry for the interruption. On the last day, you do what? Uh, on the last day, we go to Capitol Hill, and people have a chance to meet with their member of Congress or their staff um, to talk about bike safety or uh, bike accessibility. Or, you know, we'll we'll have some specific asks of things that we're trying to get through Congress. You can also tell them about what you're doing at home, and. Because that's always helpful for them to think about how it affects their constituents in their area. And, um, you know, you might make a supporter that way. Interesting. So uh, I just had an idea. I have them all the time and they're not always good ideas, but I, and, and often they're already thought of. But uh, on that day, that lobbying day, uh, can we all dress up in bright yellow vests or something or bright orange vests or wear our funny bike gear, our tight clothes or something or, or what, what do you, what, can we have a dress up day? I guess that's what I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> so for Capitol Hill day, we actually prefer that you come in business. Oh, attire. darn it. All right. Oh, can we wear business with an orange vest? <laughs> People have. All right. We definitely have. <laughs> when we started this back in uh, 2000, we definitely, there are pictures of people uh, in their spandex mm. on in the halls of Congress. So my idea is old school and maybe it's hard to be taken yeah. seriously when you wear an orange vest with your suit, huh? Yeah. Okay, so, all right. <laughs> don't believe you're a bicyclist. We'll give you a neon bike pin. Uh, oh, neat. You look like a bicyclist. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so, uh, Karen Whitaker with the League of American Bicyclists, and we're uh, talking about the uh, National Bike Summit that is coming up in March. They have uh, um, virtual and in-person options. What do uh, people go to bikeleague.org or what is it? What's the, the address? Yeah, it's bikeleague.org uh, slash bike summit. Mm -hmm. All right. Excellent. Um, and so how many people do you have there at the League of American Bicyclists now? How, many, how, how big an organization are you? Uh, I think we're 14 now. Uh -huh. Wow. I That's would say, nice. yeah, before COVID, we were probably eight. So we've grown a lot in the last few years. I think with, with COVID and everyone being home, uh, people rediscovered bicycling. Uh-huh. Yeah, do you, are you able to put that in any? Do you have some statistics that you have hanging around your head on, like, yeah, there's five more people riding bikes now than there were before, or something like that? Um, you know, I don't off the top of my head right now, but there were, I think, across the country, trail use increased like 25 percent. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and different places have different measurements, uh, but we definitely saw an increase. A lot of bike shops, you know, thought they might end up closing down and then they just got flooded, uh -huh. and, you know. And of course, at the same time, we had the um, the supply chain issues, but there was a lot of demand for bikes. Yeah, that's one of the things that uh, I guess is kind of an, a, an important element in all of this. We, we often are talking about safety, but if you can't even get a bike or you can't even fix a bike that you have, um, then it doesn't matter if it's really safe out there because you can't get out there anyway. And that was a problem that we identified at, at the, at Burning Man. And when you're talking about bike shops shutting down potentially makes it that much more difficult to get a bike fixed. And so we've been thinking about ways to, um, I, I think some countries are, are, are and, and even states in the United States are increasing the amount of bicycle repair um, instruction, right? And as a way to kind of solve that problem. Yeah, we're even seeing some community colleges start to teach bike bicycle mechanics. Really? Another, yeah. Huh. Another, another thing we've seen around the country are uh, bike co-ops or earn a bike programs. So a bike co-op is basically a bike shop um, where maybe people donate the used bikes and then they fix them up and sell them. Or you can have a earn a bike program, same situation, uh, where you get some old bikes into a shop and then a young person can learn how to fix bikes on that bike and then take that bike with them when they leave. Mm. Uh, we've also seen 
by co-op scenarios like that work with uh, immigrant populations or refugee populations where maybe they can't afford a car, but they can build a bike or they can, they can use a hmm. bike. Interesting. We have our education program, we have a, a little quick guide that goes through the rules of the roads. Um, and we started it in just English and Spanish. And now I think it's in four other languages, four or five other languages, um, from Russian to Korean to Khmer, I think, which is Cambodia. Huh. And that's a quick guide on repair. No, that's actually a quick guide on rules of the road. Oh, road rules. Uh huh. But yeah, but looking at bike co-ops, you can usually find some of those earn a bike programs. So uh, is there anything else that you would like to add about either the summit or, uh, you know, the, the league itself? So I'd say about the summit, if you are in um, new to bike advocacy, it's a really great chance to go and learn and see what other people in the country are doing. Um, and if you've been doing it for a while, it's a, it's also a great opportunity to just be in community and be with people that are, that are doing the same things and um, understand the, the struggles you're having or the, the wins that you, that you have. Fantastic. All right. This is Karen Whitaker with the League of American Bicyclists. We're talking about uh, the national summit that's coming up. You can go to bikeleague.org slash summit to learn more about the, the summit. And uh, the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance has some free um, uh, virtual attendance passes. You can write to info at bikewasho.org and ask for a pass and maybe we'll have one. Uh, maybe if you tell us the reason why you want to go in a, like a paragraph or something like that, we'll, we'll award you one. We'll see. You're listening to Bike Life Radio, KWNK 97.7 FM. I want to thank Karen Whitaker for uh, showing up and, and chatting with us about uh, the league and all your work out there in Washington. And thank you for supporting us here in, in Nevada as well through your national work. We really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to, to seeing you in person. I'd also yes. say uh, on our website at bikeleague.org, you can sign up to get our e-news. And then that's a way you can also hear about some stories from around the country and what we're doing here in Washington, D.C. Fantastic. All right. Thanks for being here. And we'll, we'll see you in a couple of months. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. A reminder, this is Bike Life Radio from bikewasho.org. I just finished reading Two Wheels Good, The History and Mystery of the Bicycle. And there's an entire chapter in there dedicated to sex and nakedness and bikes. Yes, uh, all of that is a thing. It's such a thing that there's a guy here in Reno who has curated a bicycle that implies a sexual experience. His name is Peter, and here he is. Putting on a sticker yeah, I didn't on your chest. On my, uh, my Burning Man uh, shirt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Peter, uh, we're at uh, Reno Food Systems, and we started talking about uh, bikes. And uh, uh, and you've got quite a, a some some bike stories. You you had uh, a lot of bikes, huh? Yeah. And what was happening? What was happening? You had a you had a ton of bikes at your house. Like how many? Oh, uh, it's like twenty. Why? Well, like uh, my wife and I go to Burning Man, and we we have a camp called Tiki Barn Hammocks, and uh, but you know, there's a lot of people in our camp that don't live in Reno. And so we offered, oh, we'll, we'll hold on to your bike for you till the next Burning Man. But pretty soon we have like 20 bikes. And then maybe another truth about that is I would get people asking me, hey, Pete, you know, are you looking for a bike? Do you need a bike? I always say yes, because maybe it's better than the ones I have <laughs> for Burning Man, you know. Who are these so, people that are like, hey, I've got a bike. Do you want a bike? You have this bike for uh, free. Well, the, you know, <laughs> I know, no, right? Yeah. Everyone, everyone wants, wants, <laughs> wants friends like that, bikes, right? Yeah. 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 I don't, you know, I have just a lot of different friends in town that maybe they're moving. You know, I had some move out of town and they're like, ah, we don't want to take our bikes. We'll just buy some new stuff. You know, that's not going to fit on our moving van. So they offer them to me. 
and just you know lots of friends that they decide they want a newer fresher uh bike for burning man so they just give me theirs and you know you never know what kind of condition you're going to get so you had a bunch of bikes in your yard and then what happened uh some something <laughs> strange started like x-file type stuff started happening right right they yeah. some of them started disappearing but what was weird is there'd be something left behind like a a bike that's broken and the you know it's missing a pedal or the seats off of it and it would be left for me and then they take like whoever this was was taking aliens. the best bike aliens i think it was aliens yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they would take your best bike and leave a broken bike, and then yeah. what happened? I would fix the broken bike. Uh-huh. <laughs> so oh, it was wait. your fault. I'm starting to see a mistake here. Wait, I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so you'd fix them, and then yeah. uh, and then uh, the ones that you'd fix would go missing. E- yeah, if they were good enough. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, and some there's a there was a um, this homeless guy that you know. My wife and I tried to help him out for about a month. So he was staying in our trailer and stuff, and I gave him a bike. Then he came back because someone had stolen the seat off of it. So I gave him another seat. Then he came back because he said the whole bike was stolen. And I gave him another bike, but I started getting suspicious. Uh huh. 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 I, it, are they really being stolen, or maybe he's making money here? So. Was I, he an alien? I. It could be. That's a, you know, that's possible. That's possible. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, he had an alien ship that would steal bicycles. Um, yeah. So well, I decided, you know, for, uh, you know, at least in our neighborhood and maybe Reno, a good, a good idea is lock your bike up, you know. So if you're riding your bike around and you, you stop at a store or something, lock it up. So now my new, my new rule for myself is I'm happy to give someone a bike, but they have to bring me a lock first. So, yeah. Show me a lock and I'll give you a bike. Yeah, show me a lock, I'll give you a bike, you know. So, but. uh, So, what's your address? I want to send everybody (laughs) over there. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Well, the the, the bad news is mostly I don't have this big fleet of bikes anymore because finally at one point my wife Valerie was like, yeah, no more of this. No more. I'm. This is too weird. Yeah, there's just, there's too much weird stuff going on. (laughs) And that corral of 20 bikes over there. In our backyard is, you know, I, I just think it's... That's the vortex of the of the things that were happening, the strange right. things. Yeah, I mean, if you got too close to those bikes, you might disappear, yeah. right? So, I mean, there's <laughs> there's a logic in this. you got to follow the logic. So, yeah. so I, I just start, I think it took me two years to slowly, get, you know, just keep gifting them. I wait till someone says something to me, like, hey, Pete, you know, you, you know, you happen to have a, another bike, extra bike? Yeah, 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 here you go. And I'll go as far as asking, you know, we, my wife and I have a lot of rentals and people will move into town and, you know, when you move, a lot of times you don't bring your bikes with you or whatever. So I'll check, I'll check with them. Hey, you guys got bikes? You good on bikes? You know, cause I, I'll give you a bike, uh-huh. you know, come on, <laughs> a- everyone's doing it. Come on. You know, people, people could pay you to take your bike. They maybe, or maybe you could pay them to take your bike. Damn! Now wait, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta write this down. I get confused. <laughs> yeah, I was just confused myself. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> if you uh, paid somebody to take your bike, then uh, that would probably make them very happy. You know? I yeah, I think it. They would be excited about that. Yeah. yeah. I you know the thing is I so I love bikes obviously, and the, the you know the truth is the more people I can get. That, that they have a decent bike and that they ride it around town. I'm just happy. Every time I see someone on the street on a bike, I wave to them. You know, I just, I, lo- I love seeing people on their bikes. Yeah. So I figure I can try and be a catalyst to this. You know, that's a really important point. Every time I see people, even in a car, you know, that, that give me some extra space or they stop and let me go through a stop sign without stopping, I wave at them. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to thank them and they usually wave back at me and, yeah. you know, it, it's like they don't, they don't. They understand that uh, you know we have to expend a lot of energy, so we shouldn't have to stop at stop signs sometimes, <laughs> which is nice. I like that. Oh, what? And, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's is what that I legal? do. Is that legal? Are you sure? It's not legal. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm just checking yeah. with you. <laughs> but the roads are not built for bikes, and if yeah. you don't build the roads for bikes, then how can you expect people on bikes to follow those rules of the road? Um, yeah. Good point. But uh, yeah. so. But I, I think I'm getting away from the point, which is that uh, being friendly on your bike is important, like waving yeah. at people. Oh, I, yeah. I, like I, not I, being angry. I feel the same, same as you. I love uh, when I'm on my bike, if someone's, you know, stopped 
for me at an intersection or just, you know, they're waiting because they see I'm going to go through. I always like give them a nod or wave to them. And, and it's my way of saying thank you for seeing me because when you're driving a car, you're not always looking for a little bike. You know, you're looking for other cars. And, yeah. and, and when I was younger riding, I, I've, I've been hit about four times uh, by cars. And some Here in Reno? N- no, it was mostly in Redding, California. Uh-huh. <laughs> I used to ride to work all the time there. Uh-huh. And one, one of them was totally my, my fault. But um, the others, maybe not. But I, I just learned a good habit or a good thing that I say in my head is I'm invisible. I'm invisible. Ooh. You know, I'm invisible. Like a Re- superhero. Yeah, just like a superhero. <laughs> so this guy that just passed me, even though I have my arm up that I'm going to take a right turn, he might turn right, right in front of me into uh-huh. that, that yeah. street. So I'm, I'm always watching for those. It's easy to do once you get hit once that way. You remember. Uh-huh. Unless uh-huh. your head got hit real hard. Uh-huh, then you'd forget. You might forget then. <laughs> <laughs> I'd do the same thing over and over again. Yeah, yeah. We're talking to Peter in Reno about his bike life. We're going to be right back. Imagine the things that are important to you. Housing, food insecurity, the environment. You have ideas. Let homeowners build more cheap rentals on their properties for marginalized communities. Support food service and parks. Install protected paths for clean transportation like bikes. Realize you have the power to tell the mayor and city council what you think using the website buildabetterbikenetwork.com. K-Wink is not responsible for actions taken while under hypnosis. Buildabetterbikenetwork.com. We're back on Bike Life Radio from KWNK talking to Peter, who has some great bike stories. So this is the second time you've been on Bike Life Radio. I think I interviewed you oh, before yeah, with yeah. Uh, when, when we first met and you had Ramsey. You had my yeah. my uh, my beautiful bike, Ramsey, with the crazy horns. That I, so I get friends in town. You know, if, if you're on a bike and you have your, your helmet and your dark glasses and no one recognizes you, except for if you have crazy handlebars like these Ram horn looking handlebars on my bike, I have people, they'll like text me, Peter, I saw you riding up to Dandini uh, campus uh, on your Ramsey bike. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, oh, okay. So, so that's another lesson is to have a unique bike. It, it, unless you don't want people to know where you are, uh-huh. then maybe don't. Do you worry that you made a dildo bike once and somebody stole it? <laughs> and that's a strange bike. So somebody stole right. it. Would you, somebody ever try and steal your Ramsey bike, you think? I keep it locked up. Yeah, I do. I keep I keep that locked up. I think the bike that had. But you the, didn't lock up the dildo bike. No, see that was my mistake. <laughs> I made this crazy assumption that no one would steal a bike with dildos for the handlebars, because you know, look look at what you have to grab onto to ride it around. You know, I know I hadn't thought about what. what. So, so that's not attractive for you, but maybe for some people it is. Maybe you know, like yeah. they couldn't resist it. I hadn't thought of it that yeah. way. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, they just they ride that bike around a little bit and they're just crazy frisky. Uh-huh. <laughs> it could yeah. work for people maybe that they're trying they're a couple and they want to get pregnant. Maybe uh-huh. that. Yeah, you have a bike like that, right? Like it's a bike that helps people to have children. Well, well I joke about that dildo bike because we I made it for a friend of mine uh-huh. uh, uh, at Burning Man, and when I got there and I showed her the bike, I'm like, hey, here, here's the bike for you to ride. She was like, uh, no. I won't be riding that bike. And um, later during Burning Man, one of our camp members, their bike went missing. I always say they went missing. People, you know, people will say, watch out, keep your bike locked up, it'll get stolen. I don't believe they're Ill, ever stolen. I think it's someone that had one too many beers, and they're like, my bike was green, I'll take it. That one's green, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So anyway, my camp member's bike went missing. So I said, well, you, you can ride the dildo bike. And the, the joke is, well, he did. He rode it the rest of the week, and then he and his wife were pregnant, and they did the timing. They went back to when they probably, uh, you know, mm-hmm. caused the, this to happen. Burning Man uh-huh. that year. Mm-hmm. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. Huh. And uh, that wasn't the only one. There was another one, right? Another, another yeah, there were two couple. two couples that same year, and they both got pregnant. And they, they, of course, you know, they decided not to come to Burning Man after that for three or four years because they had the little one. Uh-huh. Now they've come back. Yeah, yeah. all right. But so, there was not a dildo bike for them to ride this time, so they're safe. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. good, good, excellent. Yeah. yeah, but there may be, that bike's probably around in town somewhere getting people pregnant right now. I, I think so. <laughs> we should check if, if like, if you know, you, the, you, the number of babies have gone up some or something. Or if you know somebody who recently got pregnant, you need to ask them if they've ridden a dildo bike recently. I, th- I think, right. I wonder if any of your listeners have 
actually seen the dildo oh. bike around. Yeah, that's a good point. You want huh. them to contact you if they have, that or do you not a, want that it That might back? be a hard question for them to answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Peter, uh, with, with, who once had a ton of bikes and now does not have as many bikes. And uh, uh, thanks for being on Bike Life Radio yeah. again. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Keep riding. <laughs> yes. This is KWNK 97.7 FM from the Reno Bike Project. If you need a unique bike, check out the Reno Bike Project. They're on Grove Street. They might have whatever suits your fancy. They are ready to serve your bike fetish. They take donations of old bikes and fix them up and sell them. The Reno Bike Project is for all people and serves a low-income community on Grove Street. You can fix your bike over there for just three bucks with help. We took a trip up to Tahoe to talk tourism and winter bike commuting. Uh, We went to the Tahoe Bike Company. It was pretty quiet there, but it's important to not just talk about exciting things, but maybe even slow times, too. We liven things up on a slow day by talking to Dave at the Tahoe Bike Company. You know. People people think that there's no biking in the winter uh, when there's snow. Is right. that is that true? Uh, it just depends on how you bike and where you bike. You know, like I will bike. Um, like right now, I, I'm. You know, it depends like where you're at, and depends on how. Like we have three feet of snow, right? So a lot of people on the trails won't. You can't get to the trails. You can ride the bike paths, and you can ride on the streets. It just depends on temperature and, and uh, you know how that goes. But if you want to ride. On the trails, like where, where I live, there's a snowmobile track. So when the snowmobiles have gone through, you can just ride through the snowmobile um, tracks. They're nice and, you know, it's hard pack. And, you know, you're still riding on three feet of snow, but you can actually ride that. I mean, you know, I was hiking out there and I saw somebody who was riding, they took an e-bike through there. Huh. So, yeah. Huh. So were people riding these, like, uh, around, uh, around Tahoe here in the... Oh, yeah. Um, like today, you won't see it because it's really cold. So nobody wants to ride on black ice. That's the risk is a, a black ice. You've you got to be careful. And it also changes the way you ride. So when you ride on ice, you want to change the style of riding. You lower your seat a little bit and you change your gearing. So you're not, you, know, you don't want to be riding fast and you want to pedal hard. You want to lower your gear so you're better off. So you lower you your center your of gravity you, yeah, a little bit. You want to take this, this bike. You set it all the way down seat all the way down on wow. this bike on yeah. for me but you, what you want to do is you want to be able to set your feet flat right so when you're riding if you do have a problem you can just lean over and you just actually just set your foot straight down kind of like lower your seat and you just how you figure it out kids will figure these things out because they're like oh that wasn't fun you know when they pick up the silver off, off, off the ground and then they lower the seat you know first thing you do so it's probably the best thing it's easier if it's um today we just had the snowstorm yesterday so that we have ice everywhere but it's going to be 40 degrees on Wednesday. All the ice will melt. So it's it's fairly safe. And the people that do, there's a lot of people that commute up here. So they use their bikes all the time to commute, even in the winter. You see them all day long, you know, riding back and forth. So it's, it's, it's a doable thing. And then you have, like, fat tire bikes, and you can go off, you know, into the trails and stuff. But with this much snow, nobody's – the thing is, is a lot of people aren't interested because they can ski. And they can snowboard and they can ride. Those are the recreational oh, people. Yeah. 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 But, like, you know, for riding, it's fine. If you needed to travel on bikes, you can do it right now. Today, you'd have to dress, you know, four layers of clothes and <sighs> make sure you have a face gator because it's super cold. But tomorrow will be fine. And the next day will be even better. You know, we're going back into the 40s and the 40s will work. Yeah, you wear, like, I have these gloves that are like work gloves, but they're, you know, they're super thick and they're insulated and they're warm. So yeah, you just have to wear your gloves. And one of the things that we do on Bike Life Radio mm-hmm. is we talk to people about their uh, stories, like the, mm-hmm. if they have a bike story. And you said you were riding up until November. Do you mm-hmm. have any any like favorite bike stories over your bike life, and that uh, uh, like a favorite one that you like to tell? Not. I mean, it's kind of hard. No, not really. I mean, I've just been I cycled most of my life, so. You know, since, you know, it's hard to think about anything. Like, the, the favorite ones are, like, when I was little. And we, you know, we yeah, had that's the a good one. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I was uh-huh. little, we had uh, the guy that built the track for his uh, sand rails. We used to hike up on up Kingsbury Grade. And uh, the guy would, you know, he had these uh, these bikes. He, he had 
built a bunch of whoops to ride a sand rail and the dirt bikes on. And we, like, you know, we used to hike up there and we would ride them as hard as we could, hit all these jumps, you know. I mean, as little kids, you know, you're doing what you can. But yeah, there's some of those things were scary, right? It felt like, oh, you're gonna launch, you know, you're launching 10 feet in the air as a little kid. You're like, okay, this is a little bit much, but it was a blast because it was constant. These guys did it for like, you know, for them to really hit it hard on their, their you know, high-end motor equipment. And they left us a nice nice route for us, you know, for us little kids to ride this nice track. So that was so, one of your favorite memories oh, as a yeah, kid on Kingsbury. Kids. Yeah, on Kingsbury of all places, you know, it's gone. I think it's still there, but I don't think the trail's... I think all the whoops have, uh, you know, gotten all cleared out because of the snow, you know, years and years of, of uh, erosion. But it was there, you know, it's still rideable. What's you know, it like commuting up here, uh, would uh, you say? So well, that's the thing is I got, I, I rode from April last year until November. Um, and I would drive, occasionally would drive. But most of the time I couldn't even drive because of the... Um, or I chose not to drive. And then come August, my car actually died. So <laughs> I had no choice. I was like, okay, you're riding regardless. And, you know, um, I had a four mile commute. And honestly, let's see, I was talking to my roommate and he said to get from our house to here, basically this neighborhood, um, you know, Midtown, it was, it takes him 20 minutes and it takes me 26. So on a bike, you know, because I'm going through the trails and he's going down the road and stopping for school zones and stopping at lights and whatever and traffic. It's, you know, commuting, it's, it's if you, you have the, the, the option in Tahoe, at least, of going through the trails. So you can, you travel from neighborhood to neighborhood through the forest, whereas you got to go on the road, that's an extra mile, you know, so... Yeah, so we're at the Tahoe Bike Company. We're talking to David, uh, and uh, he bike commuted from April to November uh, up here, and you can ride through the forest. So it sounds like it's a pretty nice place to bike commute, I oh, guess. Oh, it's a great commute. Um, there's another good, great memory I saw this year. I was riding up uh, from my house out by Myers and, and coming up to work, and I hit the, you know, there's, there's a, the trail turns into a little uh, service road. There's a service road out in the, by the airport. And I'm riding up the service road, and I look out, and I see something running up the hill. And I'm like, well, what's that? Oh, I better stop. That's a big, full-grown male bear. And he's just trucking along up the hill. And it's like, you know, you see that all the time. And that's kind of the, one of the best parts about that commute is, like, you see bears, you see coyotes, you see, you know. I saw a, a peregrine falcon this year, and, you know. I've never, you know, it's been a long time since I've seen those things, but it's, it's happening every day when you're riding because you're riding through their, their home, you know, and it's like where they live and where, where they work, you know, they work in the forest. So that's where you see all the, the wonderful wildlife. Yeah. Bears so. work in the forest. Yeah. And so do peregrine falcons. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. yeah you, was... you kind of worked in the forest. Well, yeah. you were on your way to work in the forest. forest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I wonder it's if a... the bear thought that about you, that you work in the forest yeah, too. Yeah. It's like, you know, I just he knows stop. where you work. I had to stop and pause, and he looked at me, and he was like, oh, you're no big threat. And I looked at him, and I'm like, well, you are a big threat, you know. But he kept going, and I was like, okay, now I can move. And, you know, uh-huh. that's the only thing I was ever worried about was just the bear. Yeah. You know, things like that, where they kind of do the standoff thing. But it was really cool, because I was like, oh, I haven't seen one run up a hill that fast. I didn't know they could run that fast. So you, you, get a, you appreciate it. So. so you listen to KWNK 97.7 FM, uh, and this is Bike Life Radio. We're talking to David at the Tahoe Bike Company uh, in South Lake Tahoe. Yeah. What's it What's it like in terms of traffic up here, uh, bike commuting? It's probably not. Okay, wintertime is not great. Summertime is not great. Um, as far as bike commuting, wonderful. Really? Because so, you don't have to be in the traffic. Because of the forest. So, well, so, not just the forest. You have the bike trail right here. Uh-huh. You take so this street. If you take Harrison Avenue, you yeah. take that all the way down. You wind up at a bike trail, uh-huh. and now it goes all the way out to Camp Richardson, uh-huh. or you can go, you know, towards the high school. It just depends on the direction. Um, but it's, yeah, the bike trails kind of avoid the the streets. You know, is there anything that you wish was different in terms of bike commuting up here? Um, I don't know. I enjoy it so much. It's like it's so much easier to to ride. Have you had to bike commute anywhere else in your life? Portland, Others? Oregon. In Portland? Yeah. yeah. And, and how, how is this compared to that? Um, Portland has better mass traffic. Okay, so that's something I would like to have. If the option of taking a, you know, hopping on a train or a bus 
would be nice, but I don't think we have the population for it. But yeah, so you wish that, that, that Tahoe had a train, some sort yeah. of a light rail. Yeah, it would be. It would honestly be better. I think if we had some sort of light rail, it would actually work. I don't know. Well, you know, I know. Yeah, Japan obviously has a lot of it, and they have a really good rail system too. So you know, I guess yeah, there's probably a lot of the world that has it. So you know, we'd have to learn and do it. Yeah. But it would be nice to have a light rail system because you know that does work really well in Portland. It worked great with a bike. You know, you took your mass transit, and then you just. You could ride to the where you need to go, get to the, catch a bus, catch a train, and then you took that wherever you needed to go, and then you took it from there to your destination and back. And, and you then, wouldn't have to borrow somebody's car. Yeah, yeah. it's a little easier, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and you're listening to KWNK 97.7 FM. Uh, and if you have any advice for uh, cyclists out there who are uh, in, in Tahoe, what would it be? Mm-hmm. Um, wear a helmet and dress appropriately depending on season but you know um have you ever had a customer come in here with a a crazy story like they didn't wear their gloves and they had to have their hands cut off or something no (laughs) no that never never happened no no (laughs) never 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 seen it you know Uh but um yeah it's just uh it's the better way of of commuting if you have a chance you know best way to see tahoe is on a bike Uh you know you know you want to see tahoe see it on a bike so, or a train if we had one. Well, ideally, I'd say take it from the bike and then take the train to the next spot where you can take it, you know, get a better view, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, it's it's uh, it's I, be- really great on a bike. I know? just wrote an article that was in uh, Nevada Independent yeah. about how Lake Tahoe should consider rail. And uh, there's a bunch of money, a bunch of federal money yeah. available right now for rail. And the Fodor's, the travel book mm-hmm. uh came out with a, a yeah. like 20 worst places to visit or whatever and tahoe was in there because yeah. of traffic mm-hmm. and you riding your bike here that you know that reduces traffic problems and you also don't have to deal with with parking but that was kind of my take was if we had rail everywhere then maybe that would solve the you know some a lot of, the, of it i mean yeah i think you'd have a really good situation if you did have a better rail system or in the summertime it's just nuts. It's just constant. You know, there's there's 10 times more cars up here than you expect. Yeah. And that's the thing I think that throws people off is they get up here and they're like, well, I didn't think it would be this busy. And it's like, well, it's always this busy. It's like from March till, you know, I noticed I used to live here as a kid and then I moved back a few years back. And I noticed that was the thing I used to notice. I was like, hey, there's no shoulder season. The traffic's here all year round. You know, you have the problem of, you know, how traffic goes is people turn in places they shouldn't go and constantly. And then you have road rage and you get us, you know, it's that kind of a neat shot because like, you get to watch road rage. And it's like, hey, let's pull everybody, pull up a chair and take bets. You know, do you but see a lot of road rage all the time? Really? Yeah. Well, it's not so much it's in the form of like people honking horns and uh, maybe, you know, screaming out the, the window or something. You see it all the time at this corner right here at the huh. this, you know all of these little side streets off the street. That doesn't sound like a, like I can imagine coming to Lake Tahoe and you think you're gonna have a fantastic time and there's not gonna be any traffic and then you get here and there's a ton of traffic mm-hmm. and that probably frustrates people and then they and, yeah. and, and then they honk and then you've got like right. this nice, what you expected to be a quiet place and it's full of honking and angry people. And a that's little bit, <laughs> a little bit, but not, I mean, the thing like right here, you hear it. Then if you go two streets back, four streets back, it's quiet, right? You go into the neighborhood, it's, it's actually starts to get quiet. You use the, like I said, the bike trails are wonderful because they go around the main road or they're parallel to it, but it's, it's off of it. Uh-huh. There's probably 50,000 bikes in this town, you know, for rent at wow, in, in the really? summertime. Yeah. So wow. suddenly I would, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to actually do the network yeah. math, but I'm guessing it's, it's every bike shop in this town. There's tons of them and they all rent, you know, every one of them has a fleet of like 40 to hundred bikes. So rent a bike, <laughs> you know, kind of just get rid of bike, get a backpack and enjoy Instead of trying to fight traffic, that's the best way to do it, you know. I didn't know a guy last summer. He rode from, he lives in the winter in San Francisco, and he lives up here in the summer. And he rides. And he rides the way up and down. And we're like, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> so <laughs> do just a little 10-speed thing from, like, the, the 70s, and he repairs it, and he rides 120 miles or something like a day. He doesn't have a car up here. He just has his, his bike, so he just rides his bike everywhere. But, yeah, 
That's but, what it sounds legendary. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. This guy's like a legend. I saw him like, oh, this guy, I got to take lessons from him or something. And everybody's looking at me like. Take lessons. Yeah, nice, everyone's yeah. like, he's crazy. That was Dave at the Tahoe Bike Company talking about how cool it is to commute by bike in Tahoe and improvements that could be made up there. That's it for Bike Life Radio. We record out in the world with people about their bikes and their lives. Bike Life Radio is made possible by KWNK Studios in Reno. Uh, in Nevada, and <laughs> we're owned and operated by the nonprofit Reno Bike Project. Bike Live Radio is produced by the Truckee Meadows Bicycle Alliance, bikewashoe.org. Join us on May 13th for Bike Reno. <laughs> That's bikereno.com. I'm Kai Plaskon. Ride on.